In Iberia's history, there's a certain focus on the northern and southern clash between the successor kingdoms of Asturias and the Andalusian Typhus. One of the kingdoms that gets relegated to the shadows of history is Aragon. The people of Xhaka established themselves along the Aragon River and later added Catalonia to their domain through a dynastic union with the Counts of Barcelona in a not too dissimilar way to how Castile added Aragon itself to its own domain a few centuries later. Anyway, Aragon has a couple important historical figures, one of whom is Alfonso the Battler. In real life, his reign was in 1104, which is just 38 years after CK3's 1066 start. That means it won't be pulling Alfonso too far away from his actual period of rulership. He was well known in his time for fighting anyone, Christian or Muslim, and for continuous warfare against the Andalusians, where he reached as far south as Granada and Cordoba. How much actual control he'd have had over the land he conquered is questionable, of course, but shortly after his conquests, he was killed doing what he loved, dying in battle against the Navarrese without any children. That, of course, would be the end of both Aragon's massive conquests and Alfonso's lineage. But here in Crusader Kings 3, we can establish Alfonso the Battler's character to be whatever we'd like. Let's drop into Aragon in 1066 and show Iberia what it means to fight. This is Alfonso. He's full of vigor and courage, and a skilled warrior. I've given him the Alphonses dynasty, which is just his own name with an Aragonese patronymic suffix on it, given that in reality he was part of the famous Jimena dynasty, and I can't attach custom characters to an already in-game dynasty, I'm just giving him a dynasty named after himself. At the start of the game, Aragon is a tiny mountain kingdom of the Pyrenees, but these mountaineers will quickly find a new home in the forests of the Ebro River Valley. The first move for Alfonso is to find a wife that can secure him an army he can use to defeat the Moors down the mountains. For now, he's safe in his mountain home, which his opponents wouldn't dare invade, but he'll have to get aggressive if he wants to make a name for himself. Being a king by law, Alfonso is a surprisingly desirable match for most of the larger realms of the Christian and even Andalusian world, but he's looking for someone a little more local. The Catalans of Barcelona are a pretty obvious choice given their much stronger position and opportunity for a dynastic union. Agnes de Barcelona and Alfonso were betrothed, and now Aragonese and Catalan armies will go about preparing for war in the south. The elite Caballeros of Jaca will, in time, be ready to execute a hit-and-run strategy against the Muslims. Shortly into his reign, Alfonso constructed a torture room in his palace, which he can use to better understand the anatomy of his enemies and spread fear across his realm. It certainly was a character shift, but one which can only benefit him. For the first war of his career, Alfonso attacked the independent Moors of Lleida, if only to cut off other Moors from expanding in their place. The Caballeros descended the Pyrenees and soundly defeated the Moors in several battles. With his name on the map, Alfonso took a trip to Santiago to earn himself some clout in the church and even to pass through the Christian kingdoms of the Jimena siblings. Quick note, I recorded this gameplay before the recent patch that added in stopping by people's capitals and points of interest and stuff while traveling, so if you're wondering why I didn't do that, that's why. He appointed one of his favored mayors to control the realm in his stead and began a walk to Santiago. Along the way, he expressed a disdain for heathens and tried to be a pious man where he could be. Alfonso felt the comfort of God and even allowed one of his entourage to become a monk, promptly departing from Galicia to bring the wrath of God back to the Moors and whoever else might be in his way. While passing through the Basque country, the kings of Aragon and Navarra had a brief meeting where they had similar opinions about the nature of the world. Perhaps Navarra's king had a political interest in the future of Aragon, but either way, a friend is a friend, and Anso became a close friend of Alfonso. If anything, making friends with a neighbor is good for safety concerns, and with newfound confidence, Alfonso marched south into the Ebro Valley, declaring a holy war against the interloper Yemenis of Zaragoza. The Catalans were reluctant to enter the war, for fear of looming Moorish backlash. Without Catalan support, Aragonese armies initially struggled to make progress. Hearing of their allies' struggle, Ramon Berenguer of Barcelona changed his mind on staying neutral, choosing to join the war, which was exactly what Alfonso needed to put the war in his favor. Sieging Zaragoza will take some time, but Alfonso's got a couple siege engines to speed things along, and indeed the fort there did fall, after a few difficult assaults. The combined Christian army then moved north to Jaca, where the Moors were sieging the Aragonese capital. These Moors were not out of fight though, with further defeats plaguing Alfonso's army. A close battle in Sorbarbe barely worked out in Alfonso's favor after a Catalan army swooped in to save the day, and the Pope sent money to fund the campaign against the Moors in the interest of spreading Christianity. While things were looking better, a new peace entered the field, with a moor from Valencia coveting Zaragoza for himself. While nominally not at war with Alfonso's coalition, this lord was looking to take the same claimed land as the king. With the war beginning to stagnate, Alfonso returned home briefly to attend court where he met with some Sakaliva Slavs looking for a new home after escaping slavery. As a favor to these slaves, Alfonso gave control over a nearby city to them, in the hopes of spreading word of his good deeds to the world. Unfortunately, while back home, Zaragoza was taken by the Valencian Moor, meaning the prize of this dragged out war had been snatched from Alfonso's hands. During the war, many battles, both victories and defeats, took place. 
One of his mares, Chiame, made a name for himself as an acclaimed knight, being granted the title of First of the Vanguard alongside Safwan, a Moorish defector, who became the Knight of the North Star for Aragon. Shortly after these knightly orders were established, the war was over, with Fraga and Catalayud joining the Aragonese kingdom. Was this war worth it? Perhaps not. But it's over now, and the kingdom can return to a brief peacetime. Alfonso will have to bide his time given that the Taifa of Toledo has cut him off from any other viable expansion paths. These Moors are even stronger than the Yemenis he just fought, but with time, they'll fall too. Finally spending some time with his wife, Alfonso's wife, Agnes, became pregnant, which will give the Aragonese king a new way to make alliances. Many other realms are eyeing up the Aragonese kingdom on account of its rise to local power. Where they'll go is, as of yet, murky in the eyes of most of Europe. Federico Alfonsis was born in 1074. In the interest of taking down Toledo, Alfonso betrothed his firstborn son to the Abadid princess Abda, whose father ruled a large taifa at the mouth of the Guadalquivir. Emir al-Mutadid is rather old, but he's willing to fight against Toledo with his much larger army before his death. He'll be a useful asset. He'll probably need to be convinced though, so Alfonso struck up conversation wherever he could with the elderly Emir. As well, the Catalan duke Ramon Berenguer accepted vassalization, with his trust in Aragon's ambitions being assured by their military determination. For his fealty, the duke was granted Jaida and given the position of chancellor. Unfortunately, the recently forged alliance between Sevilla and Aragon ended almost as soon as it was agreed upon due to the untimely death of the emir. His son was less interested in helping against his fellow Moors, and so the betrothal was broken. Instead, Federico was offered to Duke Guilherme of Aquitaine. Perhaps someone outside of Iberia could be a better choice. Not to mention, a union with the Gascons might be a wise choice to get even more power for his family. Another son was born shortly after the betrothal. Alfonso. Conveniently, the Bretons also were interested in an alliance with the new kingdom of Aragon and they had a recently born daughter ready for a betrothal. Having secured two allies without a stake in Iberia, Alfonso was feeling confident he could take on the Toledo Taifa. A struggle for control over the Ebro River and its valleys began between two rising powers of Iberia. With the support of his allies, Alfonso has this war secured in his mind. Banning weakness, Alfonso retreated his armies into the Pyrenees with the hope of baiting the Moors into terrain they're not familiar with. The plan worked perfectly, with the Breton and Gascon allies arriving just in time to encircle the now stranded Andalusians. They were able to take up a defensive position outside of Alto Aragon, but overwhelming numbers won the day for Alfonso, who managed to capture the Emir of Toledo during the battle. In return for his life, he surrendered all of the borderlands in the de jure kingdom of Aragon, which Alfonso handed to Aragonese lords of his choice. He of course held Ducal Aragon's land for himself as his family domain. As one last war to secure his control over Aragon, the tiny fiefdom of Alvarazin was vassalized. The raging waves of war always give way to a bank of peace. For a warlike man such as Alfonso, the tides might bring forth another tsunami in short time, but what little peace can be enjoyed ought to. To fill the time, he adopted a warhorse who he named Sayinian. As well, migrations of Aragonese settlers into the Ebro Valley began under the close watch of the king. In order to secure his rule, he'll want the local population's support, and it'd be easier to just replace their rebellious moors with people of his own rather than to earn their trust. For the most part, Alfonso studied up on his military tactics, becoming a strategist army leader. For now, his military studies are complete, and he focused his life on his health now. This kingdom is far from complete, and there's no way he'll let a death by natural causes take him before his ambitions are complete. Inevitably, the peaceful period of Aragonese settlement had to end, as war between Alfonso and Toledo broke out once again. Calling upon his same allies from Gaul, another war for Iberia began, and this time, Alfonso would demand every bordering county by right of conquest. The first battle of the war was easily won in Abarathin, followed by a few sieges in the Toledo Valley. The city of Toledo itself was the prize Alfonso would need to force the emir to surrender, but during the siege, the Andalusians were able to reconvene and successfully win a pivotal battle outside the walls. Despite the victory for the Moors, this war was still very much in Alfonso's favor. The emir had died in combat, splitting his realm between his sons, who now independently ruled Valencia and Toledo separately. After defeating one brother, Alfonso went after the other brother, pushing both further south. Unfortunately, despite his victories in the battlefield, he was losing what could be an arguably more important war. In his absence, Agnes, the Queen of Aragon, was lonely. She found comfort in the arms of some Catalan lord in Urgell. This sort of scandal is completely unacceptable, and for her crimes, Agnes was imprisoned and thrown into the dungeon. Was this an overreaction? Perhaps. But it was too heavy of a hit to Alfonso's reputation. And if we're being honest, he kind of enjoyed inflicting suffering on others anyway. In the aftermath of his wife's affair, Alfonso won the war against Valencia, controlling one of the major cities of eastern Iberia. His Aragonese settlers have made good progress in turning the Ebro Valley into an Aragonese homeland, and while returning home from his campaign in Valencia, Alfonso made the decision to divorce his adulterous wife. Agnes had run out of usefulness anyway, given that the Catalans had been subjugated already. A new wife might do nicely for Alfonso, and indeed he chose the lady Katarina von Schleswig for her intellect. He had no need for political alliances, so a shrewd wife he can trust to handle minor issues in the realm would do nicely. 
While recovering from his recent wars, Alfonso focused on building up his new Aragonese homelands with hunting grounds and barracks for his troops. Once the realm was ready, he went back to war, this time from Madrid. By this point, the Taifas of Central Iberia basically collapsed, but being stubborn and stuck to the idea of an Andalusian Iberia, they wouldn't give up without a fight. Within a couple battles, the Emir, Yaya, whose subtle hairs on the nose looked nice, was captured, but rather than the normal custom of releasing the Lord in return for unconditional surrender, Alfonso instead executed Yaya in a public display of dominance. He transported the Lord all the way to Zaragoza, where the newly settled Aragonese peasants were happy to see their enemies eradicated. This move on Alfonso's part was enough to kick the Iberian struggle from opportunity into an unprecedented phase of hostility between Muslims and Christians, but it would send a strong message to the whole peninsula. As part of the execution, he gave a speech to the people. En este día, estamos aquí sobre nuestros enemigos con fervor revitalizado. Puede ser que conocéis los hechos de los señores iberios. Cobardes, todos ellos, que hacen tratados sin valor. Ellos negocian en seguir sus objetivos por cobardía. Yo desprecio a los cobardes. Desprecio pedir lo que puedo tomar en su lugar. He tomado el feudo de este moro y a su orgullo. Siguiente, le quitaré su vida. En esto, veis vuestro destino. Sabed que en mi reino, si estáis mi súbdito, estaréis seguros y podréis compartir en mi gloria. Contadlo al pueblo y a la casa. Contadlo a vuestros amigos para que la palabra de mi conquista será en toda la Iberia. Se acabó el tiempo de este moro. Verdugo empieza. The Emir sputtered in fear. It seems reports of his bravery were exaggerated. Any man, when faced with death, will certainly tremble, so maybe it's not all too surprising. Much of Andalusia indeed heard of Alfonso's message, but they would need a first-hand experience for surrendering, of course. After Yaya's execution, Toledo was assaulted, and Alfonso pushed his borders past Madrid to the gates of Toledo itself. The next war was against the Taifa of Mallorca and Murcia, and while at war, the Pope declared a crusade. The Holy Father's choice of target was interesting, to say the least. He chose Pomerania for some reason. Given Alfonso's appearance of piety and his general lust for glory, he will participate in this crusade. He's got no beneficiaries that can take the title, but the fame alone makes a crusade worth it. Having family connections off in Pomerania isn't much to get hyped about anyway. Unfortunately though, the disorganized nature of the crusade made the Slavic pagans have quite the advantage over their Christian adversaries. Alfonso tried, but looking at his cowardly Christian allies, he scoffed, refusing to participate in a war like this. The crusade was lost shortly after. Instead, Alfonso resumed his conquest of Toledo this time taking the actual city. Both the cities of Madrid and Toledo are symbols of power in Iberia, and with both under his control, Alfonso has established himself as the leading Iberian power. During a brief period of peace, Alfonso was once again looking for matches for his children. He had been blessed with eight children so far in his life, and his daughter Katerina needs a good match. One region of Iberia he had mostly ignored up to this point was the old lands of Asturias, under control of the Jimena family. There were a few disenfranchised princes which Alfonso could use to bind his own dynasty to theirs. In the future, assuming their marriage is fruitful, Caterina Alfonses and Martin Alfonses might be the parents of a cadet branch of the Aragonese family off in Asturias. As well, Alfonso took the time to revoke any land from whatever Moors had managed to keep hold of their titles. While Moors weren't necessarily required to convert as long as they submitted to their liege, animosity between Christians and Muslims was still quite high, and for that reason, the Muslims of Iberia had their titles seized. In their place, he appointed Mudejar Arabs to embarrass and demoralize the remaining Muslim Andalusians. Afterwards, a few more minor wars for bits and pieces of Valencia and other holdings were handled by Alfonso's lesser generals, and he has shifted his focus west. As a bold declaration of his intention to move west, he burned down Pamplona, the seat of Navarre's power. While looting isn't quite the same statement as actual conquest, it was meant as a message that their time was coming. If they were wise, they considered swearing fealty right there, but the pride of kings knows no bounds. Another conquest down south left the Guadalquivir Valley open to Aragonese caballeros. The Taifa of Sevilla, which briefly was allied to Aragon a few decades ago, is next on the chopping block. The great fort of Alhambra and the jewel of Andalusia, Cordoba, will complete the collapse of Al-Andalus. First marching straight into Cordoba, Alfonso's armies were uncontested. By this time, the experienced siege engineers of Alfonso's decades seasoned armies were able to take down even major walls within just a few months. The city fell, just as the first Andalusian armies crossed into Malagón. In La Puebla de Montalbón, the first battle of the war broke out, with the Andalusians holding a defensive position on the hill. Alfonso didn't particularly care for this child's play attempt at strategy, as he simply went up the hill to defeat his enemies, with superior training, equipment, and bravery. 
The Moorish army was crushed, and another siege began in Alarcos. The city fell almost immediately, and another Moorish incursion turned itself around just outside of Toledo, knowing their fate was on its way. Maybe Yaya the Brave's execution really was the only fate any of them could expect. Another battle cut down the Moors in Cordoba's hinterland, and then the Aragonese king laid siege to Sevilla itself. He hadn't seen the mouth of the river before, and its beauty humbled him a little bit. Alfonso is indeed getting old, and he's still quite proud of his accomplishments. Things would have to calm down now though. He's not as limber as he once was, and there's something to be said for enjoying the peace of a secured realm. The war was over, with every major Andalusian city now under Aragonese control. It's 1109, and the hostilities of Iberia are starting to calm down. With one last effort to put down rebellious Moorish lords, Alfonso put in more Mudejar Andalusians, but he kept Cordoba as his winter at home. Sometimes the mountains of Jaca can get cold, and his old body enjoys a more sun-kissed environment. After all this war, the first of the vanguard knighthood now held by a lowborn Enrique had reached quite the acclaim. This time of peace might see the various acclaimed knights of Aragon lose some of their relevance, but maybe they'll look forward to enjoying a repose. Aragon has been in near constant war for just over 40 years. Who isn't tired of war? Obviously, with new lands comes the need to actually assert control over that land. A king that exacts no tolls nor levies is just a figure. Maybe in all these decades of war, Alfonso finally remembered that he had a realm and a family to manage. Sure, he'd gotten a few of his kids married off for alliances early on, but since then, he hasn't even paid attention to his kids. First, the matters of state. Alfonso has only ever visited his realm's holdings in a war party, but now he comes looking for his rightful taxes. The Grand Taxation Tour will take the king around his major cities and vassals of his land, starting with some of the newly settled Aragonese homelands along the Ebro. Next, the Catalans in the east. After that was to go further south through the Duchy of Toledo and then all the way down to Granada. On the way back north, they'll stop by Valencia and then head home. The trip will be long, but hopefully relaxing. His first stop in Fraga left him with a belly too full of desserts, which was probably by design given the local count's dislike for the king. Petty rivalries are below someone as glorious as Alfonso. Things went much better in Barcelona, as Duke Pagan hosted a fine feast which was relatively uneventful. In Alcanes, Count Zurar, one of many Mudejar Andalusians, held a festival to celebrate and show off the interesting mix of Iberian and Arabic culture in Iberia. As an act of goodwill towards these converted Andalusians, he even gave away an artifact to Count Zurar. The success of this festival even resulted in a great increase in cultural understanding between the Aragonese and Andalusians. Maybe hostilities could be ceased as so long as they stayed loyal to the crown, of course. Next up was another cultural festival off in Kunka, which is also ruled by an Andalusian, Halawa. The festival as well resulted in great understanding between the Arabic-speaking and Romance-speaking Iberians, with Alfonso even engaging in some arguably non-Christian activities which made fun of the Christian priesthood. Given the failure of a crusade still stark in Alfonso's mind, this performance was taken in good jest, as it was intended. Unfortunately, a local conflict broke out in Granada which prevented the king from visiting, so he instead detoured over to Valencia. While there, he adopted a dog which he called Amiable. Turns out Andalusian dogs are quite kind, it seems. Yet another jest, the Catholic clergy was performed, and at this point, the brotherhood between Andalusians and Aragonese has really soothed the king's heart. He returned home to Zaragoza with a smile on his face, ready to check on his family. He hadn't even thought of them in forever. However, he discovered that in his ignorance, he had basically lost all of them. Turns out he had only one living child left, a daughter. At least his kids had grandchildren, so the succession was safe, but there was certainly some sadness in outliving basically every child he'd had. Alfonso went on a couple hunts to distract himself further from his dying family, and to get his dog some exercise. His hunting was admired across the realm, and it became a tradition amongst Aragonese communities to hunt wild beasts for sport. Before long though, the thirst for war came back, but only a little taste. For so long he had enjoyed the fun of hunting animals, that Alfonso needed just a sliver of the old warlike ways. He remembered the beauty of the river and coastline in Sevilla, and so declared a war to take just Sevilla. This wasn't a major war by any means, but instead just a way to see some beautiful sights while on the warpath. The Moors put up quite the fight, actually winning a battle against Alfonso in 1118 in Cordoba. This was probably the first victory for a Moorish army against Aragon in many decades. There wouldn't be another one. A couple battles later, and an occupation alongside it, the war was over, with Aragon now spanning from coast to coast in Iberia. Back to hunting. In the meantime, Alfonso's fellow Christians in Castile have also done a good job bringing their realm together. While Castile's realm is nowhere near the fame and glory of Aragon, it's certainly something to be impressed by. Word of Aragon's grandeur reached as far as the Byzantine Empire, where a mysterious letter in Greek reached the king's chambers. It was an invitation from the Roman Emperor to come fight in a tournament to be held in Arbanon. The great Roman tourney would take nearly a year to reach, but Alfonso couldn't miss this. His chances of winning are pretty low given he's now nearly 80 years old, but it'll at least be fun to watch. 
Alfonso didn't qualify for the joust on account of it just being too dangerous for someone as elderly as him. For the horse race though, he did qualify, and he'll put his experience with the wild horses of Iberia into practice for this tournament. Indeed, the superiority of Spanish Caballeros carried the elderly Alfonso to the finish line, where he won a champion racehorse. Next up were the duels, which again, for safety reasons, Alfonso did not qualify for. At the end of the day, everyone was impressed that he had managed to qualify for anything, let alone win an actual competition, and Alfonso went home with his pride not just intact, but reinforced. That being said, his health is declining, and on the way home, some of the aches and pains of the years have started to creep back into him. No matter his health though, he immediately went outdoors for another hunt. It was probably on account of all his physical activity he was doing that he even made it this long. That, however, would be his last hunt, as on his deathbed in 1126, Alfonso passed away, finally letting go of his iron grip on Iberia. He died to cancer, but his time was already up long before the cancer finished him off. His grandson, Guillen, would ascend the throne with big shoes to fill, but a prosperous and stable realm with which to do it. Guillen is very much the opposite to Alfonso's fiery ambition. Instead, he is a kind and laissez-faire sort of man. He doesn't want to bother anyone if he doesn't need to, and he's quite amicable. Indeed, he might be exactly what the realm needs in order for its continued peace and prosperity. How Guillen will be as king is yet to be seen though, as for now, that's the end of the story of Alfonso and his mighty realm of Aragon. Guillen is the product of a marriage between the Gascons and the Aragonese, and if he plays his cards right, he might just be able to claim his birthright across the Pyrenees. Perhaps he'll instead continue the Reconquista across to Lisbon, or maybe he'll do neither. These lazy characters are always a gamble as to what they'll accomplish. The year is 1127, and Iberia in general is breathing a collective sigh of relief, as Alfonso the Thief Slayer has ended his reign over the land. The struggle is in a phase of compromise and can be felt across Aragon, as Andalusians and Romance-speaking Iberians fraternize with a genuine interest in their mutual prosperity. How long this peace will last is a question for the next video. Thank you for your time. Just a quick thing at the end of the video, this unscripted, I'm just adding this in. Uh, did you enjoy the Spanish monologue thing that I did in the video? If you did, please let me know. I'm thinking about trying to do, or rather incorporate, more foreign language stuff into the videos if I can. Uh, but I'm not sure how well received it'll be, so your feedback is very important for determining if that's going to keep happening or not. Definitely let me know. Otherwise, thank you, and I'll see you next time.